Second John, I read from the new translation by Mr. Darby. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not I only, but also all who have known the truth for the truth's sake, which abides in us and shall be with us to eternity. Grace shall be with you. Mercy, peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as writing to thee a new commandment, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we should love one another. And this is love, that we should walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment according as ye have heard from the beginning, that ye might walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, they who do not confess Jesus Christ coming in flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. See to yourselves that we may not lose what we have wrought, but may receive full wages. Whosoever goes forward and abides not in the doctrine of the Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone come to you and bring not this doctrine, do not receive him into the house and greet him not, for he who greets him partakes in his wicked works. Having many things to write to you, I would not with paper and ink, but hope to come to you and to speak mouth to mouth that our joy may be full. The children of thine elect sister greet thee. You notice that uh, John is speaking about this in verse 12, that your joy may be full. And perhaps you remember when we started uh, 1 John, we have seen one of the objectives of this epistle was that uh, John wrote, I write these things that your joy may be full. In chapter 1, verse 4, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. That is what the Lord wants, that our joy would be full, that we would be in full fellowship with the Lord Jesus and with our God and Father and with one another as walking in the light. And we have seen therefore that John's epistle is really a very doctrinal epistle, it goes back to the very basics of Christianity. And that was in a day when these basic truths in connection with the person of the Christ were under great attack of the enemy. And if you read an epistle like 1 John, you would not realize it right away. But if you read carefully, you see how these statements answer uh, many uh, attacks against the person of the Christ. And even John's Gospel, which is so wonderful, was written to defend the truths of the person of the Lord. It is, uh, you would not read, uh, think that right away when you read John's Gospel, how wonderful, how beautiful, but it was to defend the person of the Christ against the attacks of the enemy. We'll mention a few of those attacks uh, in this uh, chapter that we have read. And so there were many reasons why John wrote uh, first John. We have seen it was not only that you would believe, John's Gospel was written, and I hope everyone knows that here, that you can make that your own. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. John 20 verse 31. Is that really your possession? These are written that ye may believe. So read John's Gospel with this objective, that you may believe, and that believing you may have life through his name, so that we enjoy this life, this fellowship with him. And then we have seen in 1 John that one of the reasons it was written, not only that our joy will be full, the enemy doesn't want us to be filled with this joy. He wants to have some room to come in 
And if you are not filled with joy, beware. Because there is where the enemy comes in. And then he comes with his uh, counterfeits. You don't feel happy? Oh, I know something to make you feel happy. And so he has, he has counterfeits, you know, and he has alternatives. But beware. If our joy is not full, if, our, if we are not fully enjoying the Lord and this fellowship, we are in great danger. And so John uh, helps us to be uh, stable in our faith. And we have seen at the end of chapter 5 that he uh, summarized it this way in 1 John 5 verse 13 These things have I written to you that ye may know that ye have eternal life who believe on the name of the Son of God. Anybody doubting? Well read John's Gospel and read and also this first epistle because this is written that you have no doubt left that you may know that you have eternal life for sure and so there are many reasons why this epistle has been written there were great dangers not only that there would be lack of joy but the opponents were very fierce in their attacks relentless and they attacked especially the younger believers we have seen that when we studied 1 John and that is still his uh, target today he likes to attack those who are just new believers in Ephesians 4 verse 14 Paul says that therefore it is so important to grow so that we will not be able to uh, be tossed uh, to and fro that we will uh, be stable the enemy attacks young believers and the enemy attacks also women in a very special way and what is so beautiful if we have this first epistle first John we have the doctrine it's a complete um, essay as it were it's very complete but then he has these two epistles it's like a supplement second epistle written to a sister the third epistle written to a brother why is this? Because these two epistles show us how to work this truth out. How to be very practical about it. And so you could say this way. The second epistle is written that love, sisters have a tendency to love. But this love should not be at the expense of the truth there was a great danger that this sister would receive a brother who seems to be very kind, very nice oh he can speak so beautiful but he was a deceiver and so she needed to be warned and not only the sister, notice he writes also to the children in verse 1 there are many children here and the Lord wants us to know the truth so that we will be able to um, keep it and not to be influenced by evil teachers as sisters or as uh, children we may not be able to refute false teaching that's not necessary it's able to discern and you need to be able to discern what is wrong and then take a stand accordingly and so the third epistle written to this brother Gaius we have to keep that to another time Lord willing there is the danger that he would put the truth first and forget about love the truth needs to be maintained but in love for the sister the challenge was the truth needs to be maintained um, not I mean love needs to be there but not at the expense of the truth so we have a wonderful balance in these two epistles of grace and truth of truth and love and love and truth and it's remarkable uh, just to mention that at the beginning that uh, here at the beginning of the second epistle we have six times about truth in verse 1 the elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth and not I only but also all who have known the truth the second exp uh, expression about truth verse 2 for the truth's sake which abides in us so the truth abides in us and then verse 2 the truth shall be with us to eternity so again there is great emphasis on the truth and then in verse 3 when he gives the greeting the end of verse 3 in truth and love and then in verse 4 um, 
I have rejoiced greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth. So you see there is great emphasis on truth. And in the, sec- in the other epistle, the third epistle, also six times there is a reference uh, to the truth. We will see that the next time, Lord willing. But this truth that is so much emphasized is balanced by love. As you have it in the gospel, when the Lord Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we see then, he was full of grace and truth. There is this wonderful balance with the Lord Jesus. God is love, God is light. Or God is light and God is love. And that balance you see in the Lord Jesus. But truth is put first. Because if he would have put truth, grace is put first. Because if he would have put truth first, we would have not been saved. But God's grace was manifested first, and God's grace always maintains God's truth. So there is a wonderful balance when you go through these epistles uh, between love and um, truth, grace and truth, between love and light, or light and love. Now just very quickly, uh, a brief outline in five points, and then we go to a few details. You see, first the greeting, from verse 1 to 3. Then you see the object, no, excuse me, the point that he mentioned about this joy. He rejoiced greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth. So there was a great encouragement. Before he starts to warn, he is rejoicing in the fact that some of the children of this sister were walking in the truth. And then in verse 5, <coughs> And six, we have the charge, I beseech thee, and then we see the walk in love and truth. We'll see the charge, that this balance of truth and love may be kept. And then we'll see in verse 7 to verse 11, his main concern that he expresses. And then the fifth point is a personal note and the hope that he would come and visit. So that's a very simple outline. Now, if we start with verse 1 now, let me say first something about the elder. Why does John call himself an elder? He was an apostle. But he doesn't present himself as an apostle. In fact, we, we, often he doesn't even mention his name. First John, he doesn't mention his name. Uh, John's gospel he doesn't mention his name we see it only in an indirect way the beloved disciple the disciple that Jesus loved and the other disciple but his name is not even mentioned but here he calls himself an elder because he had the qualities of a shepherd uh, in First Peter 5 Peter calls himself an elder among uh, fellow elders and there we see that the elder has the function and the ability to shepherd, to show shepherd care. And I think this is what we find here with John calling himself the elder. The word elder has many different meanings, can just be an older person, um, but it is not here the thought of an appointed elder. He was an apostle, that was his official capacity, but he cared for the flock. In that sense he was an elder to bestow shepherd care. Then the expression, the elect lady, is a beautiful um, expression and there's many theories built on that expression. I don't want to go into those theories. I just want to highlight these two points. That first of all, this, is, this sister is elect, a chosen one. And anybody here who is not sure whether he or she is chosen, then I counsel you to read First Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians, when Paul speaks about those young believers, they were just saved a couple of weeks before, a couple of months before he wrote that letter. And he knew about their election. He knew that they were chosen of God. So if Paul knew that they were chosen of God, they also could know it themselves. And here, this fact that this sister is called elect lady emphasizes the dignity, the calling, the privilege that she belonged to the elect of God. Then the word lady, uh, it is related to the word Lord. It is in the Greek very close to the word Lord. And here it is 
I think an honorable description, an honorable address to a sister to call her lady. It is like, as we say today, madam. And it is just to pay respect. So, what we see in Christianity, and that is very remarkable, that in many world religions, women have been uh, put down on a low plane as slaves, and lesser than that. But in Christianity, we see how uh, sisters are placed on uh, a very respectful level. And in Christianity, God honors women. It was God's promise to uh, Eve in Genesis 3. God honored her. He spoke about the seed of the woman. But the enemy attacked her. He had attacked her already before that, in the beginning of Genesis 3. And he kept on attacking the women in a very special way, and still today. The enemy always attacks those who are weaker. The sisters are called a weaker vessel in 1 Peter 3. And the enemy is very wicked. He attacks those who are weaker. And so he attacks the women and the children in a special way. We see that when Israel left Egypt, the Amalekites, they, they attacked the older ones who were weak, they attacked the women and the children. That is still today the target, special target of the enemy, and that shows how wicked he is. Now, we see here also that the children are addressed, and that is very encouraging. He is not only speaking to this sister, but this letter, of course, addressed sent to this sister, he addresses also her children. And that shows that the next generation also needs to learn the same truths as the mother has learned. And uh, that's often in the scriptures that we find the children connected with the parents. And that's an encouragement for all of us. As parents we have a great responsibility but also great privileges in connection with our children to bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So in that context John speaks also to the children. He cares for them. As the Lord cared for the children. So here this elder, the shepherd, cares for the children. Let us also care for the younger ones. And then he says, whom I love in truth. There again we see that balance that is uh, maintained all the time. This balance between love and truth. Truth here also means in reality. It's not just in a pretense. It's not said as a, as a form. It is really reality. Love and truth. And we talked about this balance, grace and truth, here we see love and truth, love and light always go together. You notice that for yourself and you see how often this balance is seen. And then he says, not I only, but also all who have known the truth. So here we see now the family of God, those who walk in the light, we've seen it in 1 John 1. When we walk in the light, we fellowship with one another. So we have, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. But at the same time, we have fellowship with one another as those who walk in the light. That's a great privilege. Wonderful. And so he includes here now the whole family of God. Not I only greet you, lady, but also all who have known the truth. This knowledge of the truth implies a relationship. It's not just intellectual knowledge. It's not something that you get trained in and then that's it. No, this knowledge that he's speaking about of the truth implies a relationship of love. Secondly, it implies an ongoing exercise. The way it is written here, uh, who have known the truth, you cannot see that in the English, but it implies, it's a form of a participle, that means it is ongoing. So that knowledge of the truth, in that context of a relationship of love, as I said, between with God the Father and with the family of God, that knowledge is an, implies an ongoing exercise. You can say, okay, now I know the truth, you close the book and that's it. No. This knowledge, this relationship implies an ongoing exercise. 
and it says then um, in verse 2 for the truth's sake here we see that the truth needs to be defended the truth needs to be maintained as he has done in the first epistle very clearly and for this truth's sake which is so essential he says something about that which is very remarkable in, in verse 2 this truth abides in us then we see the subjective side it is in us and this has an impact what is in you is supposed to come out is to, supposed to be seen so this is the subjective side which emphasizes formation which emphasizes uh, growth but then it says also and shall be with us to eternity then we see how this truth shall be with us what is this truth? that is a person the Lord Jesus could say I am the truth so through the Holy Spirit he abides in us you remember abide or remain is a key word for John's writings you've seen that many times in 1 John it occurs many times in John's gospel and the Lord encourages us to abide in him to remain in him to rely on him all the time then we can grow then we can be overcomers and so from his perspective the truth abides in us this is like a two way street and not only that it shall be with us in an objective sense as the Holy Spirit will be with us so the truth will be with us the Lord Jesus will be with us to eternity this is an expression that John uses 14 times in his writings it's very remarkable 14 times, 14 more times in the rest of the New Testament so 28 times we have this expression um, forever or here to eternity depends on what translation you have forever in the King James for eternity to eternity here in the Derby version and this to emphasize what remains forever that will always be the case the Lord will always be in us through his spirit and he will, he will be with us and the Holy Spirit also will be with us as in John's Gospel chapter 14 and 15 explain to us how wonderful privilege this is how we can survive in this wicked world you remember what the Lord said to the disciples in Matthew 10 I leave you here as sheep among wolves how can the sheep survive how can we survive in this wicked world the Lord is with us he said I am with you here he is shall be with us to eternity that is a solid um, that is the foundation on which we stand that is solid promise it's not an empty promise that is a real promise he is there to help us as the shepherd protects his sheep and protection is needed if you see the context of this epistle you see how protection is needed and I often pray Lord protect us let us pray and cast ourselves on the Lord to protect us and then he will protect us but if we think oh we can manage then we are in very dangerous waters verse 3 this jo uh, the, uh, the, the last part of the greeting grace shall be with you often we read in epistles may grace be with you but this is an assurance grace shall be with you it is a certainty here we have the three resources that we have grace grace upon grace we all need, always need grace but there is an abundance of resources there like an ocean of grace then mercy in view of our circumstances we all need mercy the family who lost the mother and, and like the Barracuds it's an example how they need mercy but all of us in different circumstances we all need mercy that is provisions that God gives in view of our circumstances he is rich in mercy and then peace from God this peace this implies of course the peace with God do we all have peace with God as we are here Romans 5 verse 1 that's the basis on which we stand as believers but now he wants us to supply richly these 
resources of grace and peace peace from God in the millennium the God of peace will reign but now we have already these resources from the God of peace and his peace will guide us and even help us the peace of God that um, goes above our understanding it's a wonderful resource and this comes notice from God the Father but here we see that God the Father is put on the same level as the Lord Jesus Christ he is called the Son of the Father so the Lord Jesus Christ then we see the Lord in manhood then we see the emphasis on what he is as man but the expression the Son of the Father emphasizes who he is in himself he is the eternal Son I know the expression eternal Son is not literally found in the scriptures but the truth is there like the word trinity is not found in the scriptures but the truth is there from Genesis 1 verse 1 and so the truth of the eternal son is there although the term is not used it's not true that God became father when the Lord Jesus uh, when the word um, became flesh of course in the sense God was the father of the Lord Jesus in manhood but God was always the father of the son there are many mysteries in Christianity that are higher than our faculties but faith accepts these mysteries and they are wonderful, they are great and this great God Father and Son revealed in Christianity was not revealed in the Old Testament but in connection with the Incarnation we see the revelation of the Father and the Son and this precious expression the Son of the Father this, the truth of this is under great attack of the enemy in different ways we'll see a few of these attacks in a moment and so these resources come from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus the Son of the Father and notice again it is in truth and love again this balance even when you receive these resources it is in truth and love now when we go on to verse 4 it is a very wonderful verse that this the writer could say I rejoiced greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth what a delight it was for this old apostle this man at the time that he wrote he may have been 90, 95 years old we don't know for sure but how he was thrilled to see a younger generation that's the third generation at least because he speaks to this lady who is probably a believer of the second generation compared with John and then her children the third generation and he sees they are walking in the truth perhaps he didn't know all of them but he met some of them and those he met he could say they were walking in truth can God say that of us also can, when we see each other can we say yes this is a brother this is a sister these are young people who are walking in truth that's, that's wonderful and that is the expression of fellowship you remember uh, walking in, in the scriptures speaks about our behavior our actions our words everything is included but it also implies that we the walk with God and here is the walk with God in truth at the same time it's also a walk in truth in connection with each other as walking in the light so walking in truth is not only for some oldies there up there it is for all the believers to walk in truth that's a challenge a great challenge and he adds to that as we have received commandment from the Father so this is a commandment the Father wants us to walk in truth as we find it here he wants that he wants us to walk in the light because we are of the Father the Father of lights the Father who is God who is love the God who is light he wants us to walk in truth according to that relationship we have with him so here we find love connected with obedience the commandment here is not commandment of the law of Moses this commandment as we have seen in 1 John is related to the law of Christ but the point is now that love and obedience go together they are very closely linked together we see that in the Lord Jesus he came 
out of love for the Father and he came to do his will. He said, it is my food to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. They we see obedience. The Lord Jesus loved the Father and he showed his love in keeping his commandments. And so it is for us. We have received this commandment to walk in the truth and of course that goes together with walking in love and it is to honor God the Father then in verse 5 now I beseech thee so now he comes with his first charge there is an appeal that he is making so he wants he applies now the test of love I beseech thee lady not as writing to thee a new commandment but that which we have had from the beginning what was that commandment from the beginning that we should love one another the Lord Jesus had told that already to the disciples you can read it in John 13 at the end of chapter 13 he says how they should be known by the fact that they would love one another that is the commandment that was given from the beginning and that commandment is now um, repeated here in John's writings also in 1 John and now we see this is not a new commandment probably he says this because there were teachers around they said yeah of course you should keep all those commandments but we have something we have new light you know you have also to listen to what we say and that is why John says no it is not a new commandment we we walk in the light of what has been given from the beginning and we keep walking in that light we don't add anything to that whereas those new teachers or those Gnostics or whatever term you want to give them they claim to have new light so they would be very proud to be able to say yeah but we have something new you know and we are all excited when somebody says you know I have something new we are all excited and that is what people want in general they want something new but that is not the case with Christianity Christianity is not uh, something that uh, comes out every day with new things but we need to be refreshed every day we need to be renewed every day but that's a different thing it's on the same basis that we stand from the beginning and we need to be renewed in the appreciation of the things that God has given from the beginning and that remain the same till the end and so this is the test of love that we should love one another and we have seen that test many times in 1 John and then in verse 6 we have the test of obedience I mentioned obedience and love already in verse 4 but now in verse 6 we read this is love that we should walk according to his commandments so he sets the standards for our walk this is a high standard um, and he, be, he wants us to walk according to his commandments that is the test of obedience and this, what is this? this is the commandment according as ye have heard from the beginning you, you notice again it's not something new it is from the beginning we have ten times in first, second and third John together ten times from the beginning that you might walk in it so God is not interested only that we would know the truth he wants us to walk in it according to that commandment which is from the beginning and now we come to the test of doctrine and that's in verse 7 verse 7 starts the charge he had a great concern so the charge was in verse uh, 5 and 6 the test of love to keep what was given from the beginning and verse 6 also to walk uh, in that commandment from the beginning test of love, test of obedience but now we come to his great concern because of the deceivers that were around from verse 7 to 11 and those deceivers there were many deceivers and so here is the test of doctrine that needs to be applied and that was for the sister and for her children and so the test of doctrine is important for us too today people say no don't talk about doctrine doctrine divides doctrine is essential because if we don't walk in the right doctrine how can we walk together so this is the test of doctrine Paul had warned even the Ephesians 
in uh, the elders of Ephesus in Acts 20 that even from amongst themselves that same generation men would rise up to teach perverse things to draw people behind them and even from the outside people would come in they would allow that to happen that is these deceivers and then we have seen that Peter warned uh, Jude warned and now we have seen in 1 John that it was even come to the point that deceivers had left them but here the point is they have gone out into the world uh, perhaps you remember in uh, 1 John 4 we, have, uh, the, we had the warning I'll just read that first 1 John 4 verse 1 beloved believe not every spirit but prove or test the spirits if they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. That's the same expression. They went out with great zeal to deceive people. They were convinced that they were standing for the truth, but they were standing for the lie. And so the believers were warned to test those spirits who had gone out. And here to come back to Second John verse 7 Many deceivers have gone out That goes together with that verse that I just quoted And they are very zealous So this is not the thought that we had in First John 2 verse 19 That those false teachers had left the company And so the young believers were all confused well, why, What's going on? Why? That's not the point here Here is their activity in general and they are marked by the fact that they do not confess Jesus Christ coming in flesh. I want to emphasize here that in um, 1 John 4 we have seen that these people were marked by the fact... Uh, let's read uh, again go back to uh, chapter 4 verse 2 now hereby ye know the spirit of God every spirit which confesses Jesus Christ come in flesh is of God so that implies the incarnation John 1 verse 14 the word became flesh it implies what we see in 1 Timothy 3 great is the mystery of godliness God manifested in flesh um, and the following points there is a beautiful um, summary of this truth Christ come in flesh if you confess that you are of God but then he goes on to say in verse 3 every spirit which does not confess Jesus Christ come in flesh is not of God so they denied some say well God is so high God cannot just come into the flesh and in connection with Jesus uh, what he was he was like a lower God I say it reverently that was one of their teachings but then the, the God spirit came on him with his baptism and then that spirit left him before uh, the sufferings on the cross the implication would be that we cannot be saved because it took the Lord Jesus to die for us we will go back to that in connection with the doctrine of the Christ so this is the danger they did not confess Christ, Jesus Christ come in the flesh and so they were not of God but here he goes a step further what he says in verse 7 not only that they do not confess that Jesus Christ uh, came in the flesh uh, but in the King James you cannot see that but in uh, the Darby version it said at the end of verse 7 coming in flesh so he denies he does not confess Jesus Christ coming in flesh this is the deceiver and the antichrist so what he is saying here in other words they would deny the possibility that God would come into the flesh that is what he is saying here the King James reads who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh that is in itself correct it is not the correct rendering but the thought is correct that we saw already in 1 John 4 but here the point is that he even would deny the possibility that God could reveal himself in flesh because they would say well flesh is so corrupt that is so low compared to his, with this high God that is impossible but in, in reasoning this way they set aside the essential truth of Christianity that is God revealed in flesh coming in flesh and so it's not only a possibility that is a fact that happened and so those who deny this or those who do not want to confess this 
they are the deceiver and the antichrist antichrist means against Christ and so in a very subtle way they could um, be very pious and speak much about Christ but in fact they were against Christ and were deceiving the people and those who were not uh, prepared we see that's a line of teaching all through the New Testament even in 1st Timothy 4 he speaks about uh, these kind of doctrines that I'll just read one example 1st uh, Timothy 4 So we have one of these uh, false teachings that are unmasked by Paul um, in 1 Timothy 4 where they uh, were deceiving spirits teaching of demons verse 2 speaking lies and hypocrisy and then uh, verse 3 forbidding to marry and so on and even to eat certain meats which God has created and they were also against marriage uh, as, as uh, we see in verse 3 so they really set aside God's um, thoughts and that kind of reasoning developed further and it was really uh, under the influence of Greek philosophy so these false teachings were connected with the deceiver and the antichrist we saw already in 1 John 2 this anti-christian spirit and that spirit is still around very much and attacks the truth of Christianity that attack will go on and on gets worse and worse today with mysticism a mixture of a lot of things but the truth of Christianity is under great attack now in verse 8 there's a warning in connection with this concern that John expressed there is a serious warning see to yourselves or look to yourselves so he speaks now to the sister and her children but he also speaks to all of us through this verse see to yourselves we are responsible each one is responsible for himself and now notice what he says that we may not lose what we have wrought in other words, John is saying, if you, dear sister, and probably this sister was a, has become a believer because of John's ministry, and her children also because of John's ministry, and now, if they would go astray, he says, we may lose what we have wrought. Doesn't, he doesn't teach that uh, believers can, be, can lose their salvation. But he would lose out because they would be the prey of the deceiver. And in that sense there would be a great loss. And that loss would also be counted to John. Because instead of having a believer who goes faithfully the past till the end. This believer would stop going that past in faithfulness. So in that sense he would feel uh, affected. Paul writes in similar terms uh, several times in the New Testament so he feels himself responsible and that is another point we, we have a measure of responsibility not only towards our children but also to one another and especially to the younger generation of believers we have responsibility to them to watch and to care for them and then in verse 9 whosoever goes forward this is not uh, the thought that whosoever makes progress in his Christian faith of course that needs to be the case but he's not talking about here in verse 9 he's talking about people who leave the firm foundation who want to add these new elements these new uh, truths or whatever they call it and would go forward the King James says who transgresses in that sense it is a transgression but literally the term really means as he translated in the Rabi version goes beyond goes further than uh, God has indicated and in that sense it is a transgression and abides not you remember the, what we said earlier in verse 2 the truth which abides in us and shall be with us here we see this person abides not in the doctrine of the Christ that is very serious and so these false teachers 
they, with their beautiful words, they did not abide in the doctrine of the Christ. And the consequence was, he has not God. This was a false teacher, and his false teaching uh, affected the person of the Christ, and therefore he could not be of God. Now notice here, he is not only speaking about the truth of the person of the Christ, uh, like his coming into manhood, as we have seen in verse 7. Now he's speaking in general about the doctrine of the Christ. So that is everything that, that affects his person, that affects his work. Now, really, in, in Scripture, everything is connected with the person of the Christ. And so what we see from this, that every deviation, whatever it is, will have an impact will have an effect on the person and work of Christ. So, to give you just a few examples, <clears throat> who abides not in the doctrine of the Christ, we have seen, is someone who does not confess Jesus Christ as come in the flesh. It would imply the people who do not believe that the Lord Jesus was without sin. That would uh, be an example of he abides not in the doctrine of the Christ. Or he would teach the Lord Jesus was fallible, he could sin. Or he would teach that um, the Lord Jesus, for some of those teachers, would teach, well, he did not really die, that was just an appearance. Like the, spirit, the Christ Spirit went back from him, and this uh, body that in which he appeared, just that body died. That would be a. a a very very sad thing if someone would believe that and so then you abide not in the doctrine of the Christ and so the, I, I would say it this way everything that deviates from the truth of scripture also affects the doctrine of the Christ and therefore is not of God however the, the positive side verse 9 he that abides in the doctrine he has both the father and the son that is the encouragement for all of us let us remain in this doctrine and I say doctrine is not boring doctrine is not just for a few elite doctrine is for all of us and we need to abide we need to remain in the doctrine that is connected with the person of the Christ and then if you do that you have both the father and the son you walk in the light you have fellowship with the father and the son and of course then we also have fellowship with one another so that is the positive side of this. Doctrine is important. Because then we have fellowship with the Father and the Son. We have fellowship with one another. As he said in 1 John 2. Walk in the light. And then have fellowship. Verse 10. If anyone come to you. Now this is the warning given because of this concern. There are those who are propagandists. And they go from house to house. And he says if anyone come to you. And they seek out especially women. Uh, not only in, in older days, uh, often women were at home and the, and, the, and the husband was at work. Now in our society is a little bit different. But that was often the, the situation. That they would knock at the door when the husband was away. And they tried to uh, influence uh, the women. Um, or you have it today through television programs or whatever. There are so many propagandists who do this. They come to you. They come... They they impose themselves on you in different ways through different means also through the internet chat rooms whatever <clears throat> and if anyone comes to you and bring not this doctrine do not receive him so we have to be very strict in this and that was the uh, uh, the encouragement or the exhortation that this sister needed the sister might say a reason this way you know this is such a nice person uh, he have done uh, good to us once we uh, lost some money and he gave us some help or she might have other arguments this is such a kind person he always speaks so nice but if he does not bring this doctrine John says you, you should have nothing to do with him not receive him so the the teaching here goes even further than 1 Corinthians 5 where the evil one had to be removed from the fellowship this goes even further this person, this teacher of error should not even be allowed in the home of a believer 
not only that, he should not even be greeted. Now we should say, that is very impolite. But that is, because this matter is so solemn, it affects the basis, the very basic, the foundation of our faith and the person of the Christ. And that is why he says in verse 11, For he who greets him partakes in his wicked works. It is an expression of fellowship. You cannot express any fellowship with such an evil teacher. So, the doctrine is very exclusive. It is exclusive of evil. When the Lord Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life, he excludes everything else. And in that sense, we need to be very strict as John is here. And so then he closes with this um, note of hope that he would come and visit. Again, this is shepherd care and that her joy would be made full. And I'm waiting for the moment that the Lord himself will come and that our joy may be full. That will be very soon, right? Just an application now from this verse. Um, the Lord has many things to tell us but what it will be when he will speak mouse to mouse to us that our joy may be full just an application the children of thine elect sister greet thee so there is also fellowship in this sense that the sister of this uh, sister was probably in the same assembly where John was and so he gives the greetings then to uh, the elect lady her sister and also the children beautiful expression of fellowship well time is gone we have to uh, stop now if there is an urgent question please speak up and then we can close in a hymn and a prayer and then Lord willing the next time we can go uh, on with the next epistle and then this series will be over and then if the Lord tarries we might take another subject so if there is an urgent question